present you uh, my way being uh, or my, my time being a student in Germany at two institutions called the Ohm, so the Technische Hochschule Nürnberg, Georg Simon Ohm, just the Ohm, and the Friedrich Alexander Universität Erlangen Nürnberg, which um, is abbreviated as FAU. So this is the basic um, content of my presentation. But first, of course, I would like to introduce myself. So my name is Adam Kalisch. I was born and raised in Nuremberg, that's in Germany. And um, I was always fascinated by creating media. So I started an apprenticeship as an AV media designer. Um, and I also started to use or to tinker with 3D graphics uh, pretty early by using Cinema 4D. But now um, I switched completely to Blender. Um, basically, the, the reason was the introduction of 2.5, so uh, I'm just a Blender guy right now. Um, yeah, after my apprenticeship, I started to study media engineering at the Ohm in Nuremberg. And currently, I'm studying computer science. I'm doing my master's degree in Erlangen. Yeah, so just to tell you where Nuremberg is, if you want to visit Nuremberg, um, you, have, you first have to go to Europe, and in Europe you have to go to Germany, and in Germany you have, in the southern part, you have the state of Bavaria, and in Bavaria you have Franconia, which is in the northern part of Bavaria, and in Franconia, pretty much in the center or in the middle of Franconia, you have Nuremberg, and above Nuremberg there's Erlangen. And uh, in Nuremberg, there is the Technische Hochschule Nürnberg, Georg Simon Ohm. And in Erlangen, there's the FAU, the Friedrich Alexander Universität, um, Erlangen Nürnberg. A few words about Nuremberg. Uh, Nuremberg is a, a very beautiful city. It has quite a lot of um, medieval style buildings, you can see. Um, but it also has, like, uh, it played a major role in the Second World War. So, uh, if you want to find out more about history, then you, uh, I invite you to visit Nuremberg, um, uh, yeah, just to get more knowledge about um, uh, Nuremberg and about Erlangen. Erlangen is basically well, um, is basically known for two main things. Uh, first of all for its students, because there's the FAU, the university, and, um, and also for beer, because um, there is the Bergkirchweih in, in Erlangen, which you could imagine being like a smaller version of the Oktoberfest, in case you know it. Um, yeah, But let's go back to Nuremberg, and um, let's take a look at the Technische Hochschule Nuremberg, Georg Simon Ohm, or maybe it's easier to pronounce as the NIT, the Nuremberg Institute of Technology. And the NIT has various courses to offer. Um, there are various faculties and studies. And if you would expect somewhere to find Blender, then probably uh, by studying design. But actually, this is not really the truth, because uh, the designers do not really use Blender. Uh, I did some research why uh, f why uh, the, uh, why it is like that. So um, I was told that the designers consider Blender not to be used uh, really commercially, neither by the industry nor by um, yeah marketing companies like agencies, for example. And yeah, I think well, I have a different opinion on that, but um, I think that everyone has its own opinion. Then there is media engineering, the uh, study course media engineering, and this is where the tech guys are. So, um, and if you study media engineering, it's very likely that you will find some parts uh, that use Blender during your study, during your curriculum. And I want to uh, introduce it a little bit more. So if you study media engineering, you can attend the computer graphics lecture in the third semester. And in computer graphics, you basically learn how to program in C++ and to use the OpenGL API to draw yeah, um, graphics on, on the computer screen. And um, there was, since the beginning, there was a small Blender part, but it was voluntary. And uh, here are some examples of three groups that um, did this Blender part. We'll just um, play them here.
Yeah, and uh, I. Uh, there was a time where I started to uh, to study um, media engineering, and I looked at those examples, uh, at those results, and I thought, well, I think Blender should be capable of uh, creating much more sophisticated results. Um, I also have to say that the third semester in media engineering is one of the rather difficult ones, and there was actually no real guidance in uh, in how to use Blender whatsoever. And that's why I contacted my professors, um, Dr. Stefan Röttke and Dr. Matthias Hopf, and asked them if, I, if it would be okay if I could do some tutoring in Blender, like um, help the students to create those animations. And luckily they agreed on that, and they were very supportive from the beginning on, and gave me the opportunity to just um, yeah, teach or, or help the students with their problems when they um, hit an obstacle, for example, they could overcome it somehow um, with my help or with the help with tutorials I could uh, maybe uh, know on the internet. And those are the results where I was the first time um, employed as a tutor. And it's uh, for one, it's nice that uh, you can, if people get the right guidance on how to use the software, you can see that the results they create are um, much more, they have much more life in it. And um, you can really push uh, the, uh, the talent also. Um, I'm also very grateful to my professors that they gave me the opportunity to, to just um, teach Blender. And they really see the value that Blender brings to, uh, to teaching computer graphics in general and the concepts also. Um, by the way, all of these slides are available online. I, I will not show everything just due to the time constraint I have, um, but you can watch them uh, online if you want. And now in the current winter term, uh, there's something new. We managed to integrate Blender much more tightly into the computer graphics lecture. Uh, since uh, this uh, winter term, I'm an assistant professor for the computer graphics lecture, and there is now a 25% mandatory Blender part in the computer graphics lecture. And um, yeah, students just learn how to really apply those theoretical concepts uh, by using Blender and they can try out different things, which is kind of amazing. Um, yeah. Then in the fifth semester, when you are studying media engineering, you have to complete a project. And one project proposal written there um, on the wall was um, a Blender Render Farm. And I thought, well, this sounds like the best idea to participate in. And that's why I... Um, participate in this project together with uh, some other people in the team, we had to create a render farm. Of course, many of you might know that Blender already has a render farm integrated, but the solution we had to create was a kind of a, a generic solution. So we also wanted to support other software packages, not only Blender, but uh, our focus was Blender in the beginning, and to create something that maybe also the designers um, could use. So we have created two, um, yeah, two programs, and the first one being the Xorf server, and the other one being the Xorf client, which you just, uh, when you boot up your computer, you just start the software on your on your computers, and they automatically um, do the communication. And um, yeah, if you want to render a Blender file, you just dra drag it into the software, and then you can start rendering it on the um, on the network. And yeah, uh, this this code. Uh, um, unfortunately, this uh, software did not really reach the production-ready state, but I have released it um, as open source on the web, so that you can try it out in case you want to uh, to create your own render farm or just use it. Um, for our purposes, it, it was okay, but of course, there's still you can improve. Uh, still a lot you can improve. Um, then in the sixth semester in media engineering, you have to create again uh, a project, and in our case, it was a project to create a visualization for a famous watchmaker uh, called Peter Hinlein, who uh, 
was said to have created the first pocket watch, the so-called Peter Hinlein pocket watch. And um, our task was to create two animations, one animation explaining like the, um, the, how the clock works, or the, or the watch works, I mean, and the other one being uh, to show the, the critical parts of, of the clock, why it maybe wouldn't have worked um, like, like it was set in the reality. So um, we started by getting some drawings of, of the clock, like the disassembled clock. We also had a CT scan, um, and we also later had photographs of the, of the clock. So the, the museum, which we did the animation for, they took the clock and uh, the watch and disassembled it and took photographs of the individual parts so that it was easier for us to, um, to model them. Now, I will also just quickly show you the, the animations. You can also watch them on YouTube. But on the left-hand side, you see the, the movie that um, explains like the, how does the, function, uh, the, the, the watch work in detail. And the, right, the movie on the right-hand side here shows the critical parts. Um, yeah, you will also find the, the links on the, on the slides. Of course, we had some challenges doing those animations. First of all, being uh, we managed to get the CT scan into Blender, but only the low-resolution version, so the one with the 18 with 18 million vertices. And um, Blender started to get like uh, to, to lag a bit, um, but due uh, with the help of the VBOs, the vertex buffer objects, it was possible to navigate at least the viewport um, quite smoothly. Uh, the other challenge we had was to wind up a few Z chain. We considered to use um, physics simulations for that, but it turned out that this didn't work so great. Um, we then used constraints to wind up the, the chain, but it also well it didn't look um, really really good, um, to be honest. Another chain challenge we had was to um, fade in and out sev certain components of the watch. We wanted to show just certain parts, so we um, decided to uh, animate the material transparency, which uh, unfortunately did result in something that we didn't really see the transparency in the viewport. But I think that many of those problems are solved with a new real-time uh, render engine in the viewport, like the EV um, development. Um, and should be um, yeah, solved in the future, which I find is a very great addition to Blender. Now, at the end of the um, media engineering uh, curriculum, I had to create my bachelor thesis. And of course, I love computer graphics, I love uh, Blender, I also love 3D scanning, so I wanted to combine those, those topics with each other. But unfortunately, it turned, out, it turned out that Blender does not uh, or is not capable of displaying colored point clouds in the viewport. And of course, if you work with laser scanner data, you want to display this, uh, this, those point clouds. And uh, so I had to find a way how to get the, the laser scan into, into Blender. And that's why I created a software which um, works like this. So you have your, your, la your laser scan, which is a panorama around the, the scan location. Then I take every point, I project it onto 2D space. You can see it here on the left-hand side, there's a depth image of the, um, yeah, the final depth image of the point cloud. So you just create this 2D panorama image. And then you take this 2D panorama image, wrap it around a, a 3D sphere, and you get something you can see on the right-hand side here. And um, then you can take the sphere and distort it, given uh, the depth information from the panorama image. And then it looks like this. So um, this is what I, what I chose to get my, my point cloud into Blender. But uh, I mean, it's not the best way to get the point cloud into Blender. It, should, it would be better to just have the point cloud support. But 
As far as I looked up on or I asked on Blender artists, it is not uh, that easy because the underlying data structures in Blender are not really uh, suited for displaying colored point clouds. Um, yeah, and now about the FAU. You may know the FAU from this project face to face. I will just uh, play a part of it where you um, have a webcam. This webcam can record your face. And you have a video of, of an actor or a pot politician. And then your uh, facial expression is transferred onto this video. And you can um, yeah, just fake uh, real video recordings, which is kind of scary. But um, it also shows the, the power of 3D graphics, of course. Um, OK. And there are also some famous people which you might no, or you at least you use their features. They implemented into Blender. There's um, one. There's Niels Thurai, who did his PhD thesis on fluid simulation, and uh, participated in the Google Summer of Code 2005 and implemented the first liquid solver into Blender, which is a very nice thing. And uh, I talked to him, and he um, said that doing this project with implementing into Blender was a very good idea. And um, there's also Matthias Niesner, who did his PhD on the efficient subdivision of surfaces. And this is now called Open Subdiv, and we also have it in Blender, of course. And then there's Pascal Schön, who is also in the audience here right now. And he implemented the principled BSDF. And um, yeah, that's uh, something almost everyone uses, as far as I saw it so far, and even I use it. Um, it's just a very nice um, new shader we have there. Um, at the FAU, Blender is also being taught. And that's called the Blender Seminar. So students can participate in the Blender Seminar. It's a three-week course where in the, first two week, in the first two weeks, they learn how to use Blender, how to apply their, um, their skills by modeling and by texturing and so on. And in the last week, they create animations with Blender. And I'm really running out of time, so I will just, um, again, I have these videos on the slides to, to the presentation, and they are also online. You can just watch them with sound also. Um, I will just continue and end my presentation on time. Um, of course, now, after the Blender conference, I have to create my master thesis. And naturally, I'm looking into creating or how, and, and using Blender again. Um, but the topic is 3D reconstruction from video. And um, there is still this problem, you might remember, with the point clouds. And the uh, 3D reconstruction just produces point clouds in the beginning. And we need to have a way, or we, ha we just require uh, Blender to just be capable to display those point clouds. Um, I don't know how it turns out, but of course, when I gain enough experience, I will try to implement it into Blender, but I cannot promise anything. But that's like the big goal um, to understand it. I mean, we have a, a motion tracker uh, after all, so it should be possible, I think. Now, as the last um, slide, I want to invite you to Nuremberg in case you you uh, come to Nuremberg, be sure to uh, come to the Blender user group in, in Nuremberg. It's called the Nuremberg. And um, yeah, also be sure to check out the sausages you can see on the screen here, which was obviously rendered in cycles. Um, those sausages are called Dreim Weckler, so um, just check them out. And yeah, I want to say a big thank you. Thank you, Blender community. Thank you, Blender developers. Thank you, conference team. Um, for uh, yeah, um, doing this, uh, this conference and Blender after all, and thank you for listening, of course.